put the right tool on. School for Transgenic Aesthetics Limited. Um, I'm not kidding about the limited. I do think transgenic aesthetics are limited. Like, limited by what a body can do and what you can do to a body. We asked for a permit to make transgenic bacteria here and we're waiting. Our own cats is here and we're going to sort of collab with you guys to um, get our hands wet and figure out what tissue culture is. Like most of these labs, the basic idea is um, to A, present you with the technology, B, present you with the dilemmas that the technology seems to bring up for most people, and C, uh, let you think about that more than science. It's not so bad. Um, one strange excuse that we use is to say that you are not making science or facts right now, you're making a piece of art. What does that mean? What's the difference? Actually helps inform the debate. In other words, art is perceived of as being a frivolous thing that just sort of um, supplants society with some sort of new excuse for being, but not necessarily anything political, anything um, moving, anything, um, actually anything at all except for advanced design and headiness. Okay, this is a very sort of nihilistic view of art. I happen to have it sometimes, sometimes I don't. Um, obviously I'm referring to the libidinalization of biology. I think we're alive, and that's libidinal to me. And anything that's done within the field of life or livingness is to me um, loaded with the erotic, one way or another. And when you get to tubes and things that inject and uh, vents and various different sterile tools, uh, to me it ends up being a, a certain kind of fetishism. I'll let you figure it out, what it means to you, okay? So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Oren Katz to give a sort of brief history of tissue culture. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Oren Katz, uh, I'm the director of Symbiotica at the University of Western Australia. But I started my art practice back in the mid-90s with a specific interest in tissue culture. So I got into this idea of <coughs> that tissue culture might be an interesting and uh, an evocative way of engaging with life uh, and, and open up different types of discourses in regard to the level of the manipulation of life and what it really means to us to do it now. But in a sense, and uh, hopefully tonight we'll have an argument about it, I think that tissue culture is the most fundamental uh, shift that happened in regard to our relationship to life and that's what really ushered modern biology and there's a forgotten history that uh, seems to be <coughs> driven somehow by the fact that uh, there's much more interest in the last at least 30 or 40 years in another level of uh, breaking down the body that's a molecular level although the cellular level and the level of the tissue is what really ushered that as well as ushered this perception of the, the fact that the body is a raw material for us to engineer. And from that, anything that we see in modern biology and modern biotechnology really came from. So what I'll do, I'll give you like an historical narrative to make this point. Uh, and then we'll go straight into the hands-on work. So as you've seen also in the Wikipedia entry, the credit for tissue culture uh, was given to Wilhelm Rauchs in 1885, uh, who was able to, for the first time, sustain parts of animals alive outside of the original context of the body uh, from which they uh, taken. So it was alive for a short period of time. 1895, again, you've seen it in the Wikipedia entry. Ah, no, 1895. Um, there was a realization uh, that the body is becoming a raw material. So if uh, before that, the whole idea of natural history, the, the understanding of bodies, was to do with observation, now we move into a realm where life is a raw material. Life can be <coughs> something for us to engineer, so something that we can use uh, for our own purposes. Again, tissue culture is really the idea of fragmenting bodies and maintaining those cells alive. Um, 
it's not surprising in a sense, although here Emerson says it is surprising, but in those early stages of uh, tissue and culture, uh, there was lots of media attention. It was a very interesting area for uh, the, the popular media to uh, look at those doctors, those surgeons, those scientists that were starting to take the body apart. Actually, the work was referred to them as uh, artificial life, which is interesting. It uh, was forgotten for a while before it was reintroduced in the 1980s to do with uh, computer generated life. Because that's where it was, Coney Island, and a freak show. So the first premature baby ward in the United States, which lasted for 40 years, was a freak show in Coney Island, next to the bearded woman and all of the other uh, oddities of life. And you can see it says there, uh, infant incubators with living infants. Come and see them. And so, so this, kind of, this relationship between life and technological bodies obviously is a uh, there's lots of tension there, and, and it's, I suppose what's interesting, that, uh, not surprising, that you know, artists engaging with this connection uh, tend to generate also quite a lot of uh, freak-like uh, excitement and uh, interest in this type of work, uh, putting quite a lot of different things together. But in that book, he also was referring to the fact that uh, some undesirable elements in human society should be uh, disposed of economically in gas chambers. So he was the first in the to recommend the use of gas chambers uh, that was picked up by the Germans shortly after. And, and we know what happened then. So after the war, the first successful cell line was developed. So up to now, scientists were removing cells directly from the organism and culturing them. Now cells have, most cells that are taken directly from the body have a finite amount of division they go through. It's called the half exit. Um, each time they divide, the short bit in the end of the chromosome falls off until uh, there's nothing else to fall in, the cells cannot divide anymore. Uh, but there are types of cells that can divide forever, and those are either stem cells or cancer cells. And uh, so the first cell line, the first continuous line that actually started from an individual cell was the strain L mouse that was isolated back in 1948. And those cells are still in circulation and are being used quite a lot for research, at least as a tool. So, if just as a very rough estimate, if you would collect all of those cells from that individual mouse that died 60 years ago now, it will fill this room plus. There will be more cells now, you know, filling this whole room um, out of this very one uh, little cell or little mouse. In 1951, the same thing was done with uh, humans. Uh, the first human cell line was uh, isolated from cervical cancer of an African-American woman called Henrietta Lacks and those cells are known as the HeLa cells and we can talk a bit more about them because we are going to work with those cells today so we are going to work with what can be considered a fragment of Henrietta Lacks that was taken from her back in 1951 let's see how it makes us feel 1954 Tissue culture became much more standardized, so up to then it was again a very uh, messy operation. The, the scientists had to really you know, make their own liquids, they had to set up their own systems. And in the 50s, uh, quite a lot through this uh, book, The Cultivation of Animal and Plant Cells by White, uh, this whole area became standardized. But at the very same time, he was extremely critical of Alexis Carell and the way Carell was doing his stuff. So you can read here. Right? He is sought to strip away the study from, from the study of this subject, the former atmosphere of mystery and, compliance, uh, and complications, the grey walls, the black gowns, the masks and hoods. So he's kind of going on about the decor or the, the, you know, the mise en scene of this tissue culture and how problematic that was uh, for the standardization of, of that field. Uh, then, obviously, another major breakthrough in regard to moving fragments from one body to the next, the first successful kidney transplant in humans. 1978, another breakthrough, in, if you like, in this area, and that's the first successful IVF treatment, a test tube baby. No genetics there, just tissue culture. Keep that in mind. 1991, 
the very same cells that uh, we referred to before, the HeLa cells, um, was a realization that actually they represent something different. Uh, we don't, as bi biologists, start to grapple with the fact that there's no systematic way of uh, looking at those fragments of bodies within our modes of classification. Uh, Van Velen came up with this idea that the HeLa cells, those fragments from Henrietta Lux, should actually be referred to as a new life form, a new microbe, a new form of life that uh, is originated from human, but is now a separate life form that lives in a particular environment. And in this case, the environment is the laboratory environment. And, as you see today, the HeLa cells are growing here. So, what's the galleries? 1995, the publication of uh, the paper Tissue Engineering by Robert Lacker and uh, John Sacanti. And what happened there was the realization that cells can be more than just um, exercising futile freedom, they can actually be functional if we take them outside of the body and then we introduce them into the body. So, this is really the birth of regenerative medicine. <coughs> the idea that the body is a, a regenerative site and we can repair the body using the body or materials and cells. So, the idea of regenerative medicine was uh, taking the, uh, playing on the notion that we are all closet salamanders. Some mandras have the ability to regenerate if you cut almost any organ from the salamander to grow back. And we have those powers hidden within us, but we just have to find ways to unleash them. And so that was kind of the promise and the metaphor for regenerative medicine. But I would argue that we are really more like slime molds. That the moving and shifting of cells around is more like the way slime molds, which are very interesting organisms that live very happily as a unicellular organism, like an amoeba, and then once in a while they come together to create this complex uh, multicellular structure and organism with specialized areas. Uh, so we are like that. This whole idea of regenerative medicine is about shifting and moving cells around. It's not about regenerating limbs like uh, the salamanders. So in a sense it's much less sexy, but that's what we are. Our is a model of how the body could have been repaired. Uh, that's from the 1980s, that's from 1989, uh, where failing and missing and dysfunctional body parts would be replaced by mechanical apparatuses. So the heart would be replaced by a pump and we can get bionic eyes and ears and limbs and so forth. And then 10 years later, exactly 10 years later, the idea was now we actually use the body on uh, cells to do so. So just the very basics of tissue engineering, this idea of functional three-dimensional tissue, uh, the premise was very, very simple and obviously it doesn't work. But it doesn't work for medicine, but works really beautifully for art. And, and that's this idea of, growing, of uh, producing a three-dimensional object out of those special biodegradable materials, those polymers, in the shape of the organ you're trying to replace. You then seed it with cells. This slide is actually from uh, mm -hmm. Joseph Ocanti's presentation from 2000. So in a sense, that was before the stem cell hype. So he's talking here about specialized cells rather than stem cells that can be differentiated. And then you see those cells onto the three-dimensional scaffolds outside of the body, and you grow it outside of the body for a while, and then you put it back into the body. So in a sense, bringing this dream of Alexis Carrel of repairing the body, uh, uh, almost like a mechanic, uh, bringing this dream forth. Although again, I, I would stress that that was the promise started in the mid-90s. We are 15 years later, and we're not even close to achieving this type of uh, complexity of uh, repairing or replacing uh, com complex organs. Yeah, but there's a proposition, I think it's, a, it's an evocative one, it's something for us to think about because and in particular if we think about growing things which would never be reintroduced into the body, so growing functional tissues for other purposes. Anyway, we leave it there because we have a very busy afternoon today and we are going to work both with uh, primary tissue so cells taken directly from an organism, as you can see here, which would have a finite amount of divisions, I would imagine, if we have any divisions out of them. And we work with the HeLa cells that, as Adam mentioned, uh, <coughs> he received this morning from Leiden. So it was an early uh, trip for him, and, and he got some cells which are still frozen in dry ice, which is another really interesting thing about tissue culture, because tissue culture breaks down quite a lot of uh, conventional barriers that we perceive in regard to life. So, First of all, we would be able, in theory, to grow the HeLa cells and those cells together. You can mix and match cells from different organisms. There's no immune system, so you can basically uh, co-culture almost any type of cell with any other type of cell from different origins. 
most tissue culture exercises are using at least two different types of organisms, and, that, and that's because, as we'll show you, the nutrient solution that we are using to feed those cells is derived, uh, there's, such, there's a part of it which is called fetal calcium, which derives from cows, and that's what feeds the cells. Many human cells are actually being grown on a, a layer of what's referred to as uh, feeder cells, and they are mostly mice. So often tissue culture experiments would uh, constitute at least three different origins of organisms uh, growing together and to form a new, uh, a, a new form of life, if you like. Uh, so the, that, that's one thing. The second thing is that cells can be kept in suspended animation. So you can cryopreserve cells for quite a long duration of time and you can re-animate them quite easily afterwards. And so, so that's, for example, what they've done with Dolly as well, that the actual cells uh, that were uh, used to clone Dolly were frozen cells. And so you, so you can hold the, the time, if you like. You can hold the gender and species and you can mix and match in quite a lot of different ways that we wouldn't be able to do with any other type of uh, uh, <coughs> engagement with life. So. I suppose we should start. Adam? Right. You get a volunteer from the audience to hold up. You can use the rope even if you want. <laughs> now we have an anatomy table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What we'll need is basically people starting to hack into that and we will need a clear piece of bone unopened so we can put it inside, find a nice piece of muscle and cut it and then we'll isolate the cells inside. So they need so some tools. We have the tools. Yeah. Okay, a pressure cooker will sterilize equipment. Um, it's a, I don't know about kilos per square inch, but it's 25 pounds per square inch, 20 minutes at that pressure at a, how many degrees? 121. 121 Celsius. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you have yourself sterile stuff. So we took knives and put them in gauze and then wrapped them in tin foil and then put them in here and pressure cooked them. You don't know what to find. Each one is different. So put the knife back down or whatever you have. In this case, it is a tweezer. We, we're missing some person here. I'm, I'm Stations I'm have to be filled at all times. So Adam is now sterilizing the outside by putting ethanol. Being very careful in rubbing the right places. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Ethanol penis. Now. Ethanol penis. You want me to say it three times? If you use 100% alcohol or 99% alcohol, what it does, it creates a, a layer that seals the, um, <coughs> the living or the, the organic material, so the inside is still intact. Okay. Now, Revital, can I get the knife? The idea is to try to get primary tissue from this body. Um, we need people to come and help us uh, clear up some bones from here, so you'll have to cut through the flesh and start to clean out the bones. Yeah, Sometimes I'd like to be the camera man. Well, we'll work with the ethanol later. So oh, this is, uh, yeah, good. Uh, if you can just uh, thank Mason for this amazing piece. Yeah, Mason, put together the box. He's <laughs> <laughs> by far not sterilized, eh? Yes. Are there really living cells within the testicles, you think? Or? I, Adam said that they got it this morning and that the uh, animal was butchered quite, you know, recently. I'm volunteering to work with one of those testicles, if you could cut one off for me. And you can work with <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but you have the knife. <laughs> hey, picture, yes. Do you want to get it? Not too late. Thank you. Is this one or not? Okay, let me know. You can cut me. Yeah, let's do it. Do you want to get such a funny thing? Do you want a nice just one? Do you want a nice razor? Jane? I can use your knife. Hello. Okay. 
Chelsea won, Adam. Do you want bone? No, the bone gets from the female. So what do you, so here I want muscle, so I want you to get, if yeah. I can get like a, a, a bit deep enough, right? Yeah, very so deep. these, these mm -hmm. kind of, exactly. next to the bone. Yeah. Basically, contains everything the cells need to grow. So all of the amino acids, all of the minerals and vitami vitamins they need, uh, glucose for energy, and the color of the media is actually a pH indicator. Th this is kind of the basic of the tissue culture nutrients. Uh, to that you add, as I mentioned, uh, fetal calf serum. So you usually add something like 10% fetal calf serum. Fetal calf serum is basically the blood plasma of a calf. They get the calf even before it's born, they cut the cow open, they stick a needle into the calf's heart, suck out its blood while it's still alive, and then isolate the blood plasma, the serum. It's a problem in science because each one of them is different, so it's hard to maintain a consistency of research if you have something which is variable as, uh, as that. But, uh, very few cells seem to be able to grow well without it. Then we also, just to be safe, we add penicillin streptomycin, basically antibiotics. So if there's a small contamination, you hope that the uh, antibiotics would uh, treat it. We also we're going to use something which is called trypsin. Trypsin is um, basically an enzyme, a digestive enzyme, that is being used to uh, break down the glue that holds the cells together. Okay, and it fills up. To release it, like that. Um, this is going to be kind of fun at home. Microliters is one milliliter. How am I doing? I'm not very good at this math stuff. So these are the pipette tips for these. These are also sterilized. There's this second lever, which is creation of biohazardous waste. So in other words, if you're pipetting, you want to pick up one of these, dip it into something, press down, suck up, move it into something else, press down and push all the way through, and then pop it in there and never use it again. Here's pipettes, and there's water here. Let's see if we can clear a little space for people. Um, is opening something like this with one hand, and then pipetting with the other hand, and then closing it. Now, if you can do that, then scientists think that you know what you're doing. You would pour in your potion, right? So, pouring in a potion, it could be anything. One of the tricks of science is this. If you measure things well, maybe dilute them 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, and run an experiment, it can be anything because you're doing it in the right format. You're measuring well and it's sterile, Right? In other words, if you have a control you, and anything else, you can show an effect. If you have a sterile jar, which this is not at this point, you can push this through, and then that's now a clean potion. Right?
This does make me feel a bit sick. Ooh. What? This is one, two, okay. three, four. So you can do six and then six and mm. a half. Okay. And you'll have 12.5. The hard part with the gloves is opening these. Mm. It's actually like that. And then you can, mm. you can also um, pull down and... So if you're frustrated with getting a sample of the penis, you can move to a different part. It's not necessary that you be the penis guy. Laura, do you have any do you have any uh, advice to your like a uh, it's sort of tag team penis dissection? Do you have any advice? Maybe? Yeah, I was working on the inside to get. Do you want if you want? Uh, you want no, 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 no. But, <laughs> she, but would you like a sliver from yeah, the inside? Yeah, yeah, sliver from the inside. If you can get a sliver for Laura. Right way around because I used another. Yeah, that is the right way around. I know it's open on the end. It's okay. Now, I'm gonna watch. I know it's hard right now, huh? Very good. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So, um, how am I supposed to be efficient. <laughs> well, because I, find myself like I have to say that you have, first of all, like you have the daring do. You're doing it, and you've gotten the bone marrow out, right? Yeah. And the bone marrow is right there in your plate. Yeah. That's more than enough for the entire class. Okay. Okay, so you're being quite efficient. Oh. Okay, um, but I, I don't know. I thought I don't know. I think somebody told me I was just. I had to just. I don't know. No, your passion, your passion has not okay. gone ignored. Uh, <laughs> I can, no, I can't hear. Sorry, man, we got like a thing in the middle. <laughs> How much did you say? 20 mil in each of the jars. In these? Yeah. So and that's to put the HeLa cells in. Oh, it looks better here. Alright. We could use a little more light. Let me see. Just in case. If anyone wants to try this out, it's fairly basic. You can look through. So this is. We have. How many? Who? Who? Uh, who worked on the dissection of the penis here? Laura. I don't know. Aron, do you know anyone who's done tissue culture of, say, the? Kind of phallic muscle? Muscle is not the law. I think it was a guy. And you kind of shock them into life again, and, and, and then you keep it. And it takes them a while. They're, they're, usually, cells take about a week to recover from the trauma, from the shock of being frozen and defrosted. Mm -hmm. uh, but some cells, and particularly the HeLa cells, tend to be really fast. So what you do usually when you have primary cells, you, you do what we've done, you isolate the cells, you go through the whole process of uh, trypsonizing them until you have individual cells. Uh, you put them on through those uh, dropping degrees of uh, antibiotic solutions mm -hmm. until... So that's that process. The, the real process of isolating cells would take... Usually I start in the morning, I finish only in the evening. Okay. But then once you're ready and you put the cells in the dish, you put it in the incubator, and some scientists actually pray to the god of tissue culture and you don't look at them for about three days. You don't touch them, you don't look at them, you just hope. And then you start to check and usually it takes anywhere between three days and a week again for them to recover from the trauma and start to grow. So for don't get spinach. And that's for adherent cells, so that's for cells that stick and they would stick with the primary cells and then with the HeLa <coughs> we would put in some cells, put in the media and then incubate it. Yeah. 
So I'll try to give a demo. I haven't played in this box very much myself. So. So this is not to protect us from what's inside the box, but to protect what's inside the box from us. Right? tool to open your sterile tissue culture flasks, right? You'd see a pallet at the bottom of uh, your tube, which would be very, very small. So this is, is that in a, a sense, way, yeah, way too much. And, and it's not chopped enough, but that's okay. Yeah, okay, so... But, you know, if everything was done right, there's still a good chance that out of that we would start to see cells migrating and growing out onto the dish yeah. in about five days. Yeah, not all tissue culture, there's other things that people use these flasks for, like organ culture, mm. or like what we were talking about, explant culture, which just says more or less, instead of just trying to make a cell line, you're trying to grow a piece of a kidney. This one was actually, you know, what we really need to do is dip it with ethanol, and then bring it in, and then open it, and knowing that the inside would be sterile. Where so, where, where's the cleaners of the bone? There are uh, you need a big rolls. Haran, yes. really quickly, will yeah. you open this and take this penis sample for the incubator? I'll be proud. Thank you. Ooh, we got muscle coming down. Mm -hmm. That's the bone. You've got the bone marrow, I take it. It looks like it's moving. But it's because of the liquid, maybe. Yeah, I think so. Is this penis? culture, which is scar tissue culture, and he just, his whole experiment was to run a sterile needle down the middle of the culture. It's just a monolayer of scar tissue on, on one of these dishes. Just ran a needle down the middle and then filmed them coming back in across the river of the needle scratch, right? They're, they're scar tissue, that's what they do. They, they reach across barriers and then relink and knit things back together. Rob, do you want to do the honors? Yeah. Okay. I will. Oh, stop it. All the cameras are moving in. Yeah. Yeah. That looks good. You can sort of tilt it up a little. I don't know. So it doesn't get in there. Cross uh, border control in the airport. Mm -hmm. Just uh, put your belly in. Yeah, act so natural. That's my third nipple. <laughs> I'll tell you a little story because sometimes sharing is caring. The first time I did this lab on my own, uh, teaching in New York, uh, we isolated bone marrow in a homemade hood. And I asked my students to not just tape it to their body, but to write graffiti on the flasks. Not just write like this is penis culture and the date. It's okay to write the date and what cell it is once you isolate it. You work hard, you might as well. I just didn't bring 20 magic markers like usual. But I taped one on myself. And within 20 minutes of taping one on my body, I got a call from my father, who was stuck on the US-Mexican border with a balloon in his heart. And he said, get me the hell out of here. And I went online and I found like, some doctor who does an open heart surgery called the octopus, where they leave your heart beating and they do one at a time, an octuple bypass with this crazy device that holds your heart up. And they do one at a time without stopping your heart and shove it back in and they literally sew you up with metal, like a wire. Your sternum, they have to saw it, they wire it back shut. He was walking the next day. He's still walking. What's that? I was like, 
It was 20 minutes after I put it on, I got a call. I was like, there is no way I'm taking this off my body until my dad is walking around, right? Until he's not dead. But she, and he's still kicking, so, so just be aware that it might be a potent thing that you do. These, maybe you want to talk about it, these semi-beings, these partial lives are still alive. Right now, in here, there is a bit of life, right? And Iran speaks on this quite well, but I mean, I'm just saying, like, for me, um, keeping them warm is a relational thing. Um, talking to them is a relational thing. So trying to treat them as entities which are more than what they are, which is really a bunch of cells lying in a some liquid. Mm -hmm. And people tend to feel that if they are good to them, the cells would be good back. So I need about five meals in each room. So they're able, the, the way, in order to standardize them, they isolate one individual cell out of this cancer, which was the starter cell for all of the HeLa cells we have now. Started from an individual cell that was, in a sense, taken, cloned, uh, and made copies. In the 1970s, a doctor who was working at John Hopkins Hospital, who was the place where those cells originally were isolated, um, had dinner with someone that her surname was Lux and he found out that she was the niece of Henrietta. Now at the time, they were not sure if they are working with the original cells. So they wanted to know if the cells that are still known as the HeLa cells are the original cells that came from Henrietta Lacks. And uh, this guy got the details of uh, the niece and invited her and her family to do some tests. They originally thought that the tests were to do with the cervical cancer. But basically, there were DNA tests to see if the DNA in the, LAC, in the HeLa cells are still similar to those of the Lux family. And then the story came out, and the family, the family actually found out about it. And since the mid-80s, uh, they are campaigning to get Henrietta recognized for her contribution to science, because uh, the HeLa cells were used for the polio vaccine. Uh, they were used for other things. And obviously, the medical establishment is really up in arms against it, because for them it's just a material. They don't want to recognize the person behind the cells. Um, but, uh, the HeLa cells were also used in uh, quite a few artistic projects already, uh, being such a symbolic cell as well. Then obviously telling those stories about getting cells from a marginalized person in society, an African-American woman, without her consent, being used by mainly white uh, male researchers for their publications and for their careers. Uh, when you work with those cells, and as I mentioned before, there's no difference between human and animal. Those cells, you wouldn't even know when, there's interesting risk, you know, stories about research that was supposedly done on human cells only to find out a few years later that those were not human cells. If you're not doing a specific DNA test similar to what the, the, those doctors did to the Lux family, you won't know where the cell originated from unless you, you follow the, you know, the lineage of the cells. But as, you know, even in a very clean laboratory situation, not the messiness that we have here, there's issues where people might label a, a, a dish differently or cells would contaminate and cross-contaminate. Where's Adam? I'm here. Yeah. Okay, wait for you. Yeah. Oh, I've been here for a while. So we need to open the cells. We're going to break, this, break yeah. the seal. Break the seal. Okay, they were frozen in April 2008, so they, they were not frozen for long. I, I worked with some cells that were frozen in the 60s, and you know, I opened up the veil, and they were still alive, so it took them maybe two or three days to come back to life. Those were frozen only for one year, or a bit more, longer than a year. And, and you can see this, what they've done here was a they sealed the glass on the top, so we'll have to break the tip there. Who wants to do it? How many tons of 
these cells are well, in the world? Because it's one of the most popular use cells, there's tons and tons. I was trying to calculate how many tons of cells are all around. And obviously, you can't really get the right details, but it's in the hundreds, I mean, kind of hundreds of thousands of tons of cells. And they are so popular because they replicate so easy? Yeah, and they were the first, so, you know, the way scientists operate, obviously, if they do a scientific experiment to try to keep everything the same side one okay. variable, so because everyone started with those cells, they're still being used as kind of the gold standard for basic and generic kind of tissue culture work. Uh, but and also they are really, really hardy cells. They're, 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 some scientists consider them to be weeds. Weeds. Okay. Weeds, because they're, they're actually contaminating. Yeah. How can they contaminate the whole lab? Apparently, some there's some proof that the HeLa cells can survive even when the dish dries out, or if you know when you see when you work, there's sometimes droplets yeah. that fall off. Uh, so they would just survive in the, in, in the sterile hood, and then if there's if you touch something and you touch to your thing again. And then they multiply? Yes. And so, oh, those are amazing cells. Though. Yeah, that, that's the thing with cancer cells. You know, cancer cells, first of all, lost their self-destruct mechanism, so that's why they can divide forever. That's why they're immortal. So it's weird, but, you know, those are considerably immortal cells because they came from cancer. Yeah. So you, who wants to have the honor of reviving Hila? Reanimating Hila. Re Should be one of you. I've done it before. Oh, I can. Yeah. Cool. Jump inside. The thing is, it's better if you open the vial on top of the. Yeah, but then you have to go in a little bit through because I've been in okay. and out. So. so, so you can see, you you have to snap the top there, yeah. and then pour it inside one of those dishes. Try not to knock too many things over, like I do. <laughs> I think the yeah. lost cells are so far removed from the human body that I don't need to deal with that. Thank you. So if someone wants to do this one, we can pass it to them. Have a seat. Come on now. Yeah. So. Iran, is the idea to break it and then pour it in? Yes. Yeah, and uh, try to break the tape fish. Good. And then pour the tape the rest of the dish. Your hands. Uh, no, use the tweezer. No. You can try the tweezer. Yee. Okay, can I pour it in here? Is that I think you pour it in here. The idea is you use that to keep it from spilling on the wood. I'm not sure if it's open yet. You can try a test. How many drops? Are you dripping cancer? That's it. Good we have the hood. Half of it or one third? Put 
So you can see how different this is from the primary tissue isolation. So very clean and neat. So most scientists would never see and never even realize what's the original organism from which their cells were taken. You know, we might read mice, but it's so far removed from them. This is human. This, those are fragments that were taken from human cancer. How apparent is that? Apparent? Yeah, apparent. <laughs> where, where is she going now? Incubator. Over this way. Mm. And how long will it take? Mm. Hopefully by tonight, but after the lecture, we'll look down the microscope. What you see now, if you look down the microscope now, you see those round little things floating. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we are successful, they'll settle down and we'll spread out. And we'll see the mm -hmm. Now, a very important part of uh, lab practice is not just getting ready, but also cleaning up. <laughs> There's two more here, and then Lucas isn't, I have to label mine, so let Lucas pass those two. I think this is a good way to determine what tissue culture is for general people. I don't think there's anything but general people in the world. There are no real experts of everything because we haven't figured out what's going on. But uh, for me, this is uh, a way to help people speak about tissue culture, about what it is and what it isn't, about biology, what it isn't and what it isn't. Um, and also be able to say, oh, I did that, and not be intimidated by someone who's saying what they know. And it's incontrovertible because they're from the world of knowledge and you're not. So I hope that you take with you some imparting of some sort of um, personal way of knowing this. I'm not sure what it is either, but I think that hands-on experience, um, even, with gloves. even with gloves and containment, is an important um, facet to, how do I say, not just public understanding of science, but public conceptualizing of science, right? Because it's sort of not just up to who makes up new technology as to where and when our bodies get consumed by it, right? So I hope you take that with you. I don't know. We'll see. And I uh, thank you. do is now autoclave this yeah. in the pressure cooker, but we have them alive over there, I'm crawling in them, but that's a big amount. Can there be infections in some other way we should ask on? Well, we talked about it actually quite a lot, that um, they say it can't, but that there are Tasmanian devils in Australia that are dying from an infectious cell line of cancer that they pass from scratching and biting each other.
it's nice if you, as a living organism, creep into the glove box. Oh yeah, Let's see if I can do this. Um, replacing the, the HeLa cells that were in there just. Quite a bunch of living organisms in here. Cleaning all the gloves. I'm sterilizing the these gloves for before the performance. Uh, uh, make sure they're clean. When will the cells that you carry on your body uh, start to you mean these guys? to grow? Well, after they're, four hours, they should attach to yeah. the to the side of the flask, and then um, sometime tomorrow, I should be able to look at them under the microscope and see if they've been happy here. Yeah. We'll see. And you need to keep them in um, 37 degrees. 37 degrees. You should test to see if I'm getting fat enough. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like Hansel and Gretel? Do you feel my finger? No, stay in there for a little while more. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, if you have one of these flasks, right? Um, if you have the cells in the flask and they're on the bottom, they're crawling around on the bottom. But in three dimensions, it's just uh, unusual three dimensions. Like uh, you see them from above in a microscope, they look two dimensional. But if you make a film, they're moving. Mm -hmm. They're moving about. They have dimension. Um, if you add something in there of a sculptural nature, like a glass bead or a glass sculpture, or something like um, fibrous, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. You then um, you can then uh, how do I say? Um, they'll grow into it. Mm -hmm. We'll grow into that, you know? Ooh. You gonna open it up? Mm -hmm. There you go. Oh! Oh! Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 ah, don't look! Oh. You naughty! I mean, I think, or no? I think actually there should be more scientists like me. Not only that are willing to do casual um, cultural understanding, uh, social interface work, but are willing to have fun at mm -hmm. the same time and uh, also um, touch on touchy Subjects. subjects that are, you know, bioethical subjects that um, don't necessarily please, say, the corporations. Not all scientists work for corporations or please um, even the scientific status quo, but even um, to allow for scientists to be expressive beings too. You know, they're out there. So I'm like, I make a call for the scientists because artists, there's plenty of expressive artists. Now, artists that understand what they're talking about, when, especially if they're critical of new technology, it sort of helps for them to know what they're talking about and to show that they know and that it's not that hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. I like I, do, I don't really just differentiate between lay people and mm -hmm. experts because uh, nobody knows everything and being an expert can be um, it can actually be a disability. In other words, it, you presuppose what you know and actually what we know is much less than what we think we know. Mm -hmm. So um, regular people my people, regular people, working people, um, just to, you know, baseline existence people are fucking hella smart. And so it doesn't hurt for there to be a large amount of people that understand the issues and the technologies to, to a degree where they can actually say like, you know, it's not that big a deal, a bone with bone marrow just growing in it isn't like, you know, gonna save the world, mm -hmm. but uh, also, you know, that they're remaking us, one one mm -hmm. bone at a time, this sort of thing. It's uh, it's yeah. interesting. If taste is just like, it seems to sound similar to it. Most people think aesthetics is what is beautiful. It's yeah. not, it's what you feel. So like, if you feel repulsed, that's a feeling. If you feel smug, you know, kind of like, Neh, that's a feeling. If you feel like depressed, that's a feeling. And depending on, not just the range of feelings that you're capable of, but also the range of affect, the range of emotion, 
that you're capable of feeling, say, depression, or smugness, or joy, or beauty, that's the degree that you can appreciate mm -hmm. an aesthetic. Um, taste implies that there's better or worse taste. Feeling. <laughs> feeling. Feeling. How do you feel working in the context of Vax Society as a cultural organization doing things with creative technology? Well, I mean, I think the major two things I would say is one is what is cultural and societal use? In other words, what is useful for culture and society, not for culture and society, but the people in the cultures and societies, because I still, even though I'm not into the cult of the individual, I believe in people, individual people, uh, as being part of society, but not the society making them. Number two, on that note, what's useful to a society is not necessarily utilitarian. I think you guys do a lot of interface network stuff that's about creative, subjective interaction with disparate cultures, global feelings, um, and that to me is um, more important than um, just survival, because we have problems with sharing in the world, but one of the problems that leads to the sharing uh, not happening is a uh, misunderstanding of the diversity of people. And so I'm, I'm sort of interested in how that can work. On the level of biotechnology, I mean, I think taking it to the streets like we've been doing, um, working with uh, various different cultures, like if you guys are global, I will go around the world in this box, you know, let's go. But uh, um, I think also the way that we're reaching a point where um, the future of human anatomy is going to be determined by either very few or very many, you know, and it's going to be determined in different ways in different cultures according to different aesthetics of feelings, whether it's joy or disgust or pride or, um, you know, uh, pornography. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in analyzing that, and I think the Vogue is the kind of place that does things like that, like uh, seeing how people interact with these type of new technologies on a, on a, Gut level, yeah? Okay. What, what about that more cute? Little drop of alcohol. Ethanol? Mm -hmm. Do you? Yes. That's perfect. Okay. I can add water to that? Yeah. Do you want your syringe back? Do I want my what? Your syringe back? No, that's okay. Okay, somebody's got to help me out of here. Yeah. Scientists don't get to decide what their discoveries become. Right now we have an uh, awful lot of corporate and government funding of science for discoveries that will be utilized in the traditional way, which is to increase productivity, increase weapons development, and perhaps sometimes increase human lifespan, for better or for worse, to keep people working harder, longer, maybe dying faster when they can't work. What, I, what I'm mostly focused on is um, human re-engineering, right? So uh, what some people call enhancement, I don't think of as enhancement. Getting smarter and more beautiful and taller and living forever, that's not what I would call enhancement. That's, that's a particular aesthetic, all right? And not just better, as in good or great, but actually a particular traditional way of thinking about what's better or great. Uh, biotechnology has a history of being involved with these type of things and this history is being revived in the realm of genetic engineering mixed with, say,
say like uh, family planning and breeding, right? So pre-implantation, genetic uh, testing, um, strange things that are going to be offered at fertility clinics, um, things, technologies that have to do with uh, reversing sterility. Um, all of these sort of new technologies have the potential to also add genes at the same time, at that very moment when a new embryo is being formed. It's not a new idea, it's not paranoia. I'm, we're making new kinds of humans. And in the name of, you know, the space race, or, you know, new, new biologically, biological warfare resistant soldiers, people are willing to donate whole lives, whole beings, um, to experimental beings to see if we can get one that will make a better soldier, make a better astronaut, and eventually make a ton of money, right? Like, what if we make a human that's part spider? Not like Spider-Man, but with eight legs and eight eyes and hair and likes to eat their mate, you know, this sort of thing, or um, spin a web about around normal humans and suck them dry. That sounds monstrous, but it's actually, it could be a post-natural kind of um, naturalism compared to the idea of just bigger frontal lobes or bigger tits, you know, this sort of standard, I'm not against populism, but this sort of standard um, dream which may be being funded quite well, even as we speak. Evolution tries everything. And sometimes it sees what lives, and sometimes it sees what's willing to co cooperate with the environment and other organisms, like altruism, mutualism exists. Um, but nature doesn't have a taste, you know? Nature. So, do I think we know what we're doing? with the human genome? Do I think that we understand the metabolism even of a bacteria? No. Is it genetic pollution? Probably. Will we get the results we're looking for? Sometimes. We'll have to kill a lot of embryos to get the one that looks just right. But will it be happy with uh, our aesthetic imprinted upon it? I'm not sure. Will it, they, our kindred, will they, um, thank us, you know, for making them smarter just in the rational area. Not smarter in the hippocampus with a wider range of emotions, that's not funded. Frontal lobes, neocortex, that's funded. What are we doing? You know, I mean, that's, that's my question, actually. And something like this, right? So the transformation from the visceral to the sterile and contained, right? And we're showing people it's not that far from what you do at your dinner table to what science is doing. It's not that far for you to um, be able to fathom, right, what science is. Hands-on experience makes you implicated, right? Like this, this tissue sample here that's incubating on my body. I'm implicated in the actions of science. So in some ways, it's actually um, a trick, right? I mean, that people, people have the right to say no, but much like um, the Milgram effect, when allowed, you may find people that ordinarily you thought would say no, don't say no. They actually are interested. And that's kind of interesting to me. Um, I always like the students that say no, that I say, well, you're our ethical advisor. You're on the outside. But to tell you the truth, being able to say I did that and I know what it is to me without someone from science saying we're making a fact today, but instead saying, does anyone feel uncomfortable about this? Do you want to express that? Um, for people to go home and dream, not that I did a scientific lab today, but that I did a lab that involved science that had to do with my own feeling about what I was doing. Okay, fine, thank you. Sound good? Yes. Oh. <laughs> One practical question. Yeah. We may only use this for broadcasting if you explicitly give us your permission. So could you please on camera? All right, so my ethical give advisor, <laughs> if I give on camera my right for broadcast, is he allowed to make a million dollars on me?